we're trying to understand how people feel about brands, how they relate to brands. That is to say, what the brand's personality is, as far as consumers are concerned. And there are a number of techniques which are very, very helpful for uh, getting to that, uh, to that understanding. The consumer is given crayons to doodle, to express their feelings, to go inside their own head, pull out their feelings, and somehow get them onto paper. And these are ordinary drinkers uh, expressing their feelings about drinking Guinness. Here you see a rich, very female aspect of Guinness. So if you were describing a woman who somehow, to you, had that character, what sort of person is it? Paula Yates, who used to lay in bed, surrounded with magazines, and chocolates like a 50s starlet. Out of this research, the marketeers began to detect a new individualism. In particular, among those who had voted Conservative for the first time in 1979. They no longer wanted to be seen as part of social classes, but to express themselves. And crucial to this were the products they chose to buy. We identified that there was this trend towards what might be called individualism, where people wanted to still be part of a crowd, but to express themselves as individuals within it, to have their own personalities, to be, I suppose, their own men. I didn't want to be the same as everybody else. I wanted it to be a little bit different, a little bit individual. It's quite individual upstairs. It's not remarkable, but I think it's quite individual. It is expensive. It's Italian. It's Italian. It's expensive and it's good quality. A we little bit set, different. Yeah, we want to set our own standards so nobody else has got what we've got. We just didn't want it. Be the Earth. same as everybody we else. We just want to be different. Business responded eagerly to this new individualism. But it soon became one of the main forces driving the growing consumer boom in Britain. Using the data from the focus groups, Manufacturers created new ranges of products that allow people to express their individuality. Business also recategorized people. They were no longer divided by social class, but by their inner psychological needs. If the primary need is security and belonging, we call the groups mainstreamers. Um, if it's status and the esteem of others, then it's aspirers. If it's control, it's succeeders, and if it's self-esteem, it's reformers. And this new marketing culture began to take over the institutions previously dominated by a patrician elite, in particular the world of journalism. The assault was led by the profession of public relations. In the past, PR had been seen as seedy and corrupt, but now it became a glamorous business, promoting products and celebrities. And one of the rising stars was another member of the Freud family, Matthew Freud, the son of the Liberal MP, Clement. What Freud and other PRs realised was that they could use their celebrities as levers to infiltrate advertising into the editorial content of newspapers. The newspapers were offered exclusive interviews with celebrities, but only if they also agreed to mention products made by Freud's corporate clients, in terms dictated by the company. What happened with Freud's was that you effectively got some kind of product placement or even product, the manufacturers of the product got some degree of control over how their products would appear in print. So if, for example, you did want to write about Caprice's uh, passion for stuffed crust pizza, you would sign a contract which guaranteed that you would mention the firm Pizza Hut uh, in at least twice uh, in certain positions in the introductory paragraph of, of, of the article, that you would agree to run the Pizza Hut logo at such and such a size in such and such a place, and of course that you would agree to run the enclosed pictures of Caprice eating her stuffed crust pizza. There was no choice about how you would run this article in the press. You were effectively told how to run the article in the press. By Freud's. By Freud's. It's the rise of the corporate culture and the rise of, of business. To traditional journalists, this infiltration of advertising into the editorial pages was a corruption of their profession. But to Mrs Thatcher's allies, like Rupert Murdoch, who owned The Sun and The Times, it was part of a democratic revolution against an arrogant elite who had too long ignored the feelings of the masses. They hate to see someone communicating with the masses. They feel that newspapers, the written word is not for the masses. That should be left to television, or perhaps to nobody. You I'm very proud of the sun, and the sun was not represented tonight in your film. You just took page three, which everyone seems so fascinated with. 
about page one, page two, every other page of the paper. It was a typical piece of slanting and elitism by the BBC, who, after all, in order to get viewers for this program, have put on a very sexy episode of Star Trek, just which I was watching out in the room there. Oh, I don't think they put it on to get us viewers. I think we just are lucky to they follow. They try to carry viewers into these show programs. You, you, you know how it's done. By the late 80s, Mrs. Thatcher and her allies in advertising and the media had brought the desires of the individual to the centre of society. As last week's episode showed, it was the same transformation that President Reagan had brought about in America. Both politicians had encouraged business to take over from government the role of fulfilling the needs of the people. In the process, consumers were encouraged to see the satisfaction of their desires as the overriding priority. To Thatcher and Reagan, this was a new and better form of democracy. But to their opponents, in the parties of the left, they had summoned up the most selfish and greedy aspects of human nature. Ronald Reagan and Margaret Thatcher both embraced an economic philosophy that says the unit of judgment was not only the individual, but it was the individual's personal satisfaction, the individual's own unique happiness and well-being. It was, in a sense, the triumph of regarding individuals as purely emotional beings who have needs and wants and desires that need to be satisfied and can be satisfied unconsciously. It goes way back to the early part of the 20th century, to Freud, to notions of the unconscious, um, the assumptions that we are, uh, in terms of our rational minds, we're little corks bobbing around on this great sea of hopes and fears and, and desires of which we are only dimly aware. And that the role of a marketer, uh, the role of somebody selling something, including a politician, is to appeal to this great swamp of, of desire, of unconscious desire. The left believed the opposite, that the way to create a better society was not to treat people as emotional, isolated individuals, but to persuade them to realize that they had common interests with others, to help them rise above their individual feelings and fears. Let me assert my firm belief that the only thing we have to fear is fear itself. Nameless, unreasoning, unjustified terror which paralyzes needed efforts to convert retreat into advance. This idea had flourished in America in the depression of the 1930s. President Roosevelt, faced with the chaos caused by the Wall Street crash, encouraged Americans to join together in trades unions, to set up consumer groups, and to pay for a welfare system for those trapped in poverty. His aim was to create a collective awareness which would become a powerful weapon against the unfettered power of capitalism which had caused the crisis. That idea had driven the Democratic Party for 50 years. But now, Roosevelt's inheritors railed vainly against the effects of the self-interest encouraged by President Reagan. There is despair, Mr. President, in the faces that you don't see. Maybe, Mr. President, if you stopped in at a shelter in Chicago and spoke to the homeless there. Maybe, Mr. President, if you asked a woman who had been denied the help she needed to feed her children because you said you needed the money for a tax break for a millionaire or for a missile we couldn't afford to use. The worst thing Ronald Reagan did was to make the denial of compassion respectable. He said, you've worked hard, you've made your money, you shouldn't have to feel guilty about refusing to throw it away on people who choose to be homeless and who choose not to work. That's what he said. He said it with an elegance and a kind of benign aspect that disguised its harshness. You think we can't do anything about it? Well, why not? If we can work together now to look after the lives of the people here, I don't see why we couldn't work together afterwards to clear up the mess 
and help build a better world in which these things can't possibly happen. The qualities we've learned from comradeship and common suffering are not going to be wasted after this war. It's out of experience like ours that the new world will be built. Rise!